Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of House of the Dragon episode six, where our cast grows up so fast, the kids are not all right, and Ladybug Laris is loose. So much to break down, no time to waste, let's get started. And really the first thing to point out, HBO's new banner poster for this series features Olivia Cook and Emma Darcy with the giant dragon Vagar behind them. Its golden eye has the iris slit in the shape of Aegon the Conqueror's dagger, a dagger that will literally come between these two women next episode. Now, since we've jumped forward 10 years, the opening title's bloodline imagery has a ton of updates. Where before we saw Viserys and Emma's dials, now we see Alicent's dial on the high tower green side in the far background, with four branches snaking down for her children, Aegon, Helena, Aemond, and we don't see him in this episode, but there is a fourth kid on the way at least, Darren. From the foreground, we see a new bloodline flowing into a new dial for Daemon Targaryen. Depicting his dragon-winged helmet, blood flows from that to a blue-colored dial behind him, which we then see in close-up, depicting the braid of Lyanna Velaryon, Daemon's new wife. Her bloodline flows to two blue ring dials with dragon eggs in each for their twin daughters, Rihanna and Bela. The dial depicting Rhaenyra's Valyrian steel necklace now branches off toward an engraving depicting dragons over a fleet, but major detail here, her bloodline is connecting with another dial on the far right, and that is not a Valarian dial. That is a dial of Sir Harwin Breakbone Strong, with the three rivers of the House Strong sigil representing the green, red, and blue forks of the trident, because obviously Rhaenyra's sons are Harwin's kids. And this river of blood also forks into three, Jaceris or Jace, Lucerus or Luke, and Joffrey or Joff. All three of these have a pale blue ring since they are Valarion's name, but their symbols are all their own and will have greater significance as this story unfolds. Miguel Sapochnik returned to direct this episode since with the new cast, it's pretty much a second pilot for the series. Whereas episode one featured Emma's tragic childbirth sequence, this episode opens with Rhaenyra's. And you'll notice Sapochnik shoots this in an excruciating unbroken three minute take. Though he might've hidden a cut in the quick pans or when something breaks the frame, but still this take followed immediately by another two minute and 40 second tracking shot through the castle has the effect of centering us on Rhaenyra's pain, delivering that child, and then immediately having to go on a long walk all the way to the queen's chamber. If you think about it, the reason Rhaenyra does this walk is she knows who the father is, she knows Alicent wants to check the hair color, and she does not want to part ways with this baby in case its hair color exposes him and her other two sons to the sword. She's not taking any chances. And really, these opening minutes occur in real time with the new Prince Joffrey's life in this world. We open on Black as he crowns, and we see how he spends roughly the first eight minutes of his life. Last episode ended with the death of one Joffrey. This episode opens with the birth of the boy named after him. But the moment the baby comes out, notice the nursemaid's reaction. Boy, princess. Praise <laughs> mother. <laughs> Yeah, her face says it all. She's reacting to the color of the boy's hair, a dark brown, like both of his older brothers, because as this nursemaid knows, this is another bastard and more royal drama to follow. Now, one of the things I love most about fantasy is the epic scope of everything. You're not just facing off against another knight for your honor. The fate of the realm is at stake. Of course, in my day-to-day -day life, the stakes are much smaller, like whether or not I could fit another Gimli figure on my collectible shelf. Now, obviously that's super exciting, but sometimes what you really need are those big epic fantasy level stakes. And that's when I bust out my phone to play. Lord of the Rings Rise to War. Lord of the Rings Rise to War puts you in the middle of Middle Earth, controlling vast armies to conquer Dol Guldur and claim the ring. Lord of the Rings Rise to War has all of my favorite parts of strategy simulation games. There's a strategy involved in how you gather your resources, how you manage your resources, and which factions and fellowships you join to increase your power. Little decisions like which commander to pair with which army or which resource tile to acquire next can make huge decisions on a grand scale. It's so much deeper than just being unstoppable on the battlefield, and that's what really sets Lord of the Rings The Rise to War apart from other strategy simulation games. And that's on top of appearances from Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, and a ton of other of my favorite characters from The Lord of the Rings. This is the best time to get started in The Lord of the Rings Rise to War, and if you use the link in the description or scan this QR code, you'll get a limited Hobbit's Adventure package. Hit the link and support new rock stars by downloading this game. It's that easy. Just click the link in the description, and I will see you in Middle Earth. Rhaenyra and Leonor's walk through the castle again, a nearly three minute unbroken shot is impressive mostly because it shows how large of an interior set they actually built for this show with a grand staircase that actually leads to a higher level, which is really rare in TV shows. Normally the stairs just kind of go to nowhere and then they cut to a different set where they're upstairs. But Sapochnik wanted to inhabit this set properly and introduce the characters at an older age by forcing us to spend some time with them. The moment uh, Rhaenyra gives birth until she meets Alicent, was not in the original script. I thought, well, if we're gonna have this set, I would like us to inhabit it properly, which is why the opening actually 
follows our characters in a single continuous take all the way through. <sighs> This guy, Lord Caswell, congratulates them. If I may be of any service. The day may yet come, my lord. Yeah, Lord Caswell will play an important role in the conflict to come as a supporter of Rhaenyra, so she will call in that favor. And guarding the Queen's door is Sir Criston Cole, who inexplicably managed to keep his job in the King's Guard despite murdering someone on these two's wedding day, including assaulting the groom, which just goes to show how little the Crown really cared about Leonor and his Knight of Kisses, and really goes to show how powerful Alicent has become. The fact that they have to pass Sir Criston at the doorway here likely is what led to Leonor naming that boy Joffrey after the guy Sir Criston killed. It almost seems out of impulse to force the queen and her bodyguard to remember this name. King Viserys joins them, looking like mid-montage Smeagol, one hand short of the comfort level I would need to give a newborn to. A fine prince. Sturdy. You will make a fearsome knight. Sturdy, or another word for strong. Outside this chamber, Sir Kristen now has his back to them as they pass, the ultimate cold shoulder. Rhaenyra says, You don't think to consult me before you name my child. He's our child, is he not? Any one of us is bleeding. This and Rhaenyra saying Leonor has not been interested in her affairs as of late. Yeah, not exactly subtle. Neither is the literal trail of blood leading back to Kristen and the Queen. Just a reminder that those blood rivers in the opening titles aren't just about succession, they're about the bloodshed that comes with it. Rhaenyra finds her sons Jace and Luke back with their real father, Sir Harwin. We chose an egg for the baby. Ah, oh, that looks like the perfect one. I let Luke choose. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, that little thank you from the younger brother to the older and the way that the older brother grabs his brother's hand to keep him from getting burned. These boys aren't total shits, at least not yet. There's just something to be said for mixing non-Valyrian DNA into this bloodline. In the dragon pit, Jace meets his dragon, Vermax, whom he and the dragon keepers command with high Valyrian words like Mbas, meaning hold, and Dohaires, meaning serve, as in Valar Dohaires, all men must serve. You'll notice Alicent has dressed her sons in high tower green, whereas Rhaenyra's sons wear Valarian blue. But none of these kids wear the Targaryen colors of red and black. Jace successfully binds with Vermax, who torches a lamb. Now, Aegon is already binded with his dragon, Sunfire, and Jace's younger brother, Luke, has already binded with the dragon that goes unmentioned here, but in the text, it's Arax. So as the oldest, who's gone through this a couple times, Aegon yawns at Vermax, and it is clearly his idea to prank Aemon with the Pink Dread, a play on the dragon, Balerion, the Black Dread. So Aemon, humiliated, wanders deeper into the pit, where he runs into a chained up dragon, and right as that dragon begins to breathe fire, you can see its scales are a pale blue color. This dragon is dreamy. Fire, the bluish silver she dragon whose eggs Damon stole one of in episode two. This is a dragon that will bind with Aemon's sister Helena. We meet Helena, who has a case filled with beetles and moths and scorpions, and she fawns over a millipede. It has eyes. I don't believe it can see. And why is that so? Do you think? It is beyond our understanding. I suppose you're right. Some things just are. Yeah, this series is doing something different with Helena than in the text. I think we're gonna learn that Helena is a green seer and or a warg. You remember green seers like the three-eyed raven, they can see into the future. Wargs can transplant their minds into animals. Both are associated with the magic of the children of the forest and the faces in the weirwood trees are believed to be how the green seers are able to do their green seeing. Just notice how Helena's words are deeply prophetic. Aemon, what have you done? He did it again. They said they found a dragon for me. The last ring has no legs at all. You will have a dragon one day. He'll have to close an eye. I know it. Yeah, book readers know what he'll have to close an eye refers to, and we're gonna see it next episode. But I think the last ring having no legs could be a reference to the Green Seer King, Bran the Broken, a kid who Helena would get along great with. Because Helena says that each ring has two legs, 60 rings creating hundreds of legs, which I think is a metaphor for each generation of rulers needing a king and a queen, the bloodline being the leg to the next branch, as every episode of the series has begun by showing us. This line of succession is gonna continue to the last ring of the story, Bran, someone who cannot walk. And Sansa says that he cannot bear children. Therefore, the wheel, or in this case, the ring, is broken. Helena says the millipede has eyes but cannot see, and I think that's just her way of saying these rulers are cursed with literal eyes but don't have the proper vision of green sight. But she likely does, and so does Bran, and maybe so do others in this story. Remember, Helena's dragon will be Dreamfire, and I think she inherited the Targaryen skill of Viserys wishes he inherited from his ancestor, Daenys the Dreamer. In this case, it is Helena the Dreamer. Viserys
Sisters' pathetic model train set of Valyria has expanded now with various structures topped with stone dragons like the one Allison gifted the king. I love how Sapochnik frames that V-shaped insert of the tall structure so that a background torch is perfectly framed in the valley of it, creating the illusion of a volcano, like one of the volcanoes that destroyed old Valyria. Allison questions the parentage of Rhaenyra's sons, and Viserys sends away a stonemason who's named Eddard, a metanod Eddard Stark in Game of Thrones, who spent most episodes on a paternity crusade of his own that also involved a bastard named Joffrey. Allison says, To have one child like that is a mistake. To have three is an insult. And as she says this, notice the hilt of Aegon's dagger is right by her hand, foreshadowing a move she will make with that dagger next episode to act on this suspicion. But Viserys refuses to see the truth. He compares this to a black horse he once had that bred with a white stallion, as silver as the moon on a winter's night, producing a fall, the color chestnut. Nature is a thing of mysterious works. Yeah, you can't see a parallel with his expectation of a silver white stag just to find an unremarkable brown one. I think that was the episode when he really gave up on trying to read into signs and portents. Sir Kristen calls Rhaenyra the C word and Allison says, I have to believe that in the end, honor and decency will prevail. Followed by the most ironic jump cut to Aegon making a mess out the window. Ah, the things we do for love. And the fact that Allison doesn't really react to him doing this suggests that he might be doing this all the time. But really, the bigger concern for Allison is the preservation of her bloodline. You are the challenge! You are the challenge, Egon! Simply by living and breathing! The way all of their dials are pre-engraved into the stone in the opening credits shows how these characters are really destined to be in conflict with their relatives the moment the bloodline flows into them. They don't really have much control over what's ahead. Over in Pentos, Daemon rides his dragon Caraxes, but finds himself in the shadow of a much larger one, Vagar, written by Lana, who actually referenced Vagar in episode two. But Vagar still lives, somewhere, but too large for the dragon pit. The workers at Spice Town report hearing her song at times. They say it's a sad thing. Yeah, Vagar's sad song might foreshadow the dragon's repeated losing of her lady riders. If you think about it, Lyanna's first and final word of this episode is Dracarys. Vagar is the largest living dragon currently, who was once ridden by Visenya, Aegon the Conqueror's sister wife. Notice how Vagar's wings have holes in them from old age. And I love how they just use the scale of Lyanna's body on Vagar's saddle compared to Daemon on his saddle just to convey Vagar's immensity. Prince Reggio Haratis says, Lamb hearts are excellent. Yeah, remind us of that roasted lamb heart that the dragon Vermax ate earlier. We learned that the Triarchy has joined forces with Dorne, and Reggio wants their three dragons for defense. Damon considers it, but Lana doesn't want to be used. We are not minstrels or mummers who play at the pleasure of an alien prince. We are the blood of old Valeria. Mummers is essentially what they were earlier, putting on a dragon fire show for the crowd. And Damon may be remembering his own two small parts in the Mummers play back in King's Land in episode four. Sir Kristen oversees a sparring session in the yard with the boys after his mother's warning. Notice how Aegon has gone from yawning to swinging hard on that dummy. Jace shoulder checks Aemond and Aegon pats Luke on the shoulder. It's an interesting contrast in the status and respect among these four kids. Aegon, the old and Luke, the youngest of the four, were the first two to bind with dragons, leaving Jace and Aemon with this rivalry, both of them avoiding being the last one to bind to a dragon. Sir Kristen puts Jace and Aegon together. Eldest son against eldest son. Yeah, Lionel's reaction says it all. He knows Jace and Luke are secretly his grandsons, and he doesn't really like how Sir Kristen is setting up this conflict, putting it on display for everybody. During their fight, Aegon shoves the dummy over on Jace. Foul play. I'll deal with him. Can't your fate use a hiding advantage to use it? Yeah, we hear Sir Kristen's advice to Aegon, but not what Sir Harwin says to Jace, leaving everyone to get suspicious. So Sir Kristen takes it out on Jace by letting Aegon go crazy on him. And when Sir Harwin complains about it, he dickishly drops his sparring sword for Harwin to have to reach over again to pick it up. And Sir Kristen taunts Harwin. Most men would only have that kind of devotion toward a cousin or a brother. Or a son. Aegon's hair is blocking his face, but he is flashing a wide grin under there. And as Harwin is dragged away from punching Kristen, Aegon continues to smile in shock, showing how this kid is old enough to get the subtext. And he's probably going to continue to use this against his cousins. Lanor comes in singing with Sir Carl Corey, who immediately sobers up when he sees Rhaenyra in the room, because Carl probably knows what happened to the last of Lanor's male lovers when he overstepped. This guy has a smarter head on his shoulders than Joffrey did, so just keep an eye on him. Lanor drunkenly rants about the chance to fight in the Stepstones. He says there is a Tyroshi general there. A giant, they say, who dyes his beard purple and wears women's frocks. Yes, this Tyroshi general is Rikalio Rindun, described by George R. R. Martin as one of the most curious and flamboyant rogues in the annals of history. I don't think we're going to meet him on the show, but I'm glad he got mentioned. Lyanna shames Demon. You spend your time here in the library reading accounts of the same dead dragon lords whose legacy you claim has no hold on you. 
Didn't know I was being so minutely observed. Remember earlier, Leanna caught him teaching Baela how to speak High Valyrian. So despite his prodigal exile in Pentos, his dragon legacy keeps calling him back. At the small council meeting, both Rhaenyra and Alicent now join, each with their own punch card ball. They discuss a dispute between the Brackens and the Blackwoods in the Riverlands, those are the long warring families whose young lords dueled at Storm's End at the beginning of episode four. They mention Lord Grover Tully. George R. R. Martin actually named Lord Grover after the Muppet Grover, along with Grover's grandson, Elmo, and great-grandsons, Kermit and Oscar. I'm not kidding, those are actually their names. Alicent wants to leave this as a local matter, but Rhaenyra presses on. My and lords. yet, the Brackens and the Blackwoods will use any excuse to spill each other's blood. This dispute bears looking into. There will be country folk who know where the lines have been drawn for generations. That is easy enough. Yeah, already showing a difference in the leadership style between these two queens. One wants to be hands-on and preemptive, deal with problems immediately. One is a more passive leader who wants to stay out of these conflicts. Lionel tries to move on to Tylan Lannister's Stepstones report, but he still reacts to Alicent's hostility, and poor old Lyman Beesbury just struggles to keep up. If you ask me, I think the Blackwoods have the upper hand. No. We've moved on to the Stepstones, Lord Beesbury. Yeah, we got a new Archmaester, Orwile. We actually saw him last episode. He was the kid then who recommended an herbal remedy to Melos. The fact that Melos is gone now might actually be the reason Viserys has been alive the past 10 years and still able to walk, because he was not looking good at the end of last episode. I think it just shows that it was really Melos' treatment that was holding back. The new Master of Laws is Jasper Wilde, nicknamed Ironrod. Some say because of his unyielding respect to the rule of law. Some say because he sired 29 kids. Rhaenyra stands to apologize, and while all the others sit, Alicent does not. Rhaenyra offers Allison to marry Jace to Helena, really the nicest of her boys to the green scene bug girl, a niece to a bastard uncle. Uh, not great, not terrible. And if her dragon Cyrax gives more eggs, she offers to give Aemon his choice of them. So Allison's response is really grounded in stubbornness and a personal grudge toward Rhaenyra. Instead of hearing her out, she shuts her down as a hormonal mother. Rhaenyra. Alicent says to Viserys, She feels the earth washing away beneath her feet, and now she expects us to ignore her transgressions and for me to marry my only daughter to one of her plain featured sons. Yeah, she almost said to one of her bastards. And she goes on, You may do as you wish, husband, when I am cold in my grave. And I like how the staircase railing separates this married couple in the frame. Lionel Strong tries to resign, but refuses to verbalize his reasoning. Allison passes a maid who giggles at her when she passes. Allison probably sees this as another reason to feel paranoid that the whole crown is laughingstock now that the strong rumors are going around. We learn that Lord Larys Strong has been sort of a master of whispers for the queen. Learning that his father and brother are headed to Harrenhal, he recruits a murderer, a deviant, and a traitor to the crown for a mission. His cane is marked with his sigil, which according to HBO's prop listing, is a firefly. They actually designed this cane head so that it looks like the firefly is stuck in tree sap. They're kind of like John Hammond's amber cane in Jurassic Park. Oh, what a little jolly flea circus you've created, Lord Varys. Spared no moral expense. Now, if Larys is so smart, I don't know why he'd show his face to these criminals instead of using like a middleman, or why he'd mark these arsonists with brooches of the same firefly sigil on his cane. Meanwhile, Lana struggles to give birth, and the surgeon says, We could lay open the wound, try to remove the infant by way of the blade. But I cannot say for a surety whether it lives. Would the mother survive it? No. But Lana hears this and she pushes away, intent on not suffering the same fate as Emma. So she orders Vagar to Dracarys, giving herself a dragon rider's death. Harwin says goodbye to the boys and to Rhaenyra. I will be a stranger when we meet again. Now he means a stranger to this boy, but it's also a signal that he's about to meet the stranger, the one of the seven who represents death. Jace cuts to the chase. Is Harwin Strong my father? Am I a bastard? You are a Targaryen. That's all that matters. Of course, she doesn't say yes or no, but she's pretty much signaling to Jace the truth because Rhaenyra has given up trying to keep this secret. She tells Lannor that they are leaving on a midnight train to Dragonstone, but she tells him he can bring Sir Carl, who ends the scene by sliding a dagger in its sheath. Lionel and Harwin Strong burn alive in Harrenhal, which was a mystery in the book that readers have ascribed to Damon, maybe the ghost of Harrenhal, but now we learn it was orchestrated by Larys and his Firefly mutes. His voiceover posits that children are a weakness, a way for people to try to form a legacy beyond death, but it ultimately leads people to make poor choices. We may know what is the right thing to be done, but love stays the hand. Love is a downfall. 
Maybe this is just me rereading Fellowship of the Ring right now, but this reminds me of an exchange between Gandalf and Frodo about Gollum. Frodo says, What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. And Gandalf responds, Pity. It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. Not to strike without need. And he goes on to say, My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. And when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. Yours not least. The idea is similar here. Larry says love stays the hand, and that because of love, people make blind choices that shape the fates of many. This series is, at its heart, about how love stays the hand and dooms us all. But that ultimately is just the mysterious nature of things. The closing montage shows the burnt remains of Lana and Harwin, Rhaenyra's lover and Damon's lover, the lovers standing in their ways toward each other, both claimed by fire. Viserys still holds onto Emma's ring and he kisses it on his finger, but he sees the rat spying on him from this room. This rat keeps showing up again and again. He was spying on Rhaenyra from the skull of Valerian the Black Dread as she snuck out of the castle. He spied on Alicent from her bedpost. He was weirdly sipping on Joffrey's blood during Rhaenyra and Leonor's wedding at the end of the last episode. YouTuber Joe the Magician posted a fascinating theory that Larys Strong might be a warg or a green seer. Larys somehow knew that the Archmaester brought Rhaenyra the tea. Larys might be warging into that rat to spy on everyone and to gather this information. He did have that meaningful moment with Alicent by the Weirwood Tree, and their home of Hall is situated beside the God's Eye Lake, which has the Isle of Faces in the middle that contains a grove of Weirwood trees. It is a hugely spiritually significant location to the Song of Ice and Fire lore that we have yet to visit in live action, and I think we actually see that island in this episode in the wide shot of Hall. Laris's sigil of the Firefly could connect with Helena's interest in insects, maybe something he instilled in her as he nurtures her green scene abilities. To top it all off, the writer of this episode, Sarah Hess, actually said about Laris in the inside the episode featurette. He's a player and he's looking into the future and seeing what she is going to be. Larys ends this episode funneling that same red flower from Bravos that he brought up to Alicent in the Godswood last episode, talking about how an outside species of flower could grow so well here inside the castle. We thought he was referring to Alicent, really, he was referring to himself, how he is growing strong. On one hand, this series is a clear destination of the well-documented Dance of the Dragons and which Targaryen's gonna win it all at the end, which of them are gonna die, but on a deeper layer is some additional lore and mythology that's not really touched on in Fire and Blood, and I'm so excited to explore that. This show is doing a good job keeping both people who read the book and didn't read the book invested. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EA Boss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.